Hi everyone, I'm Anessa Chandra, and I thought I would be presenting to you on the colorful world of kelp, which would have been a project based in Catalina about um, the color light that kelp are exposed to, uh, any biological processes ex uh, associated with that light exposure, and um, environmental conditions. However, since um, this would have been my first time out on Catalina and I was not able to do any of that research. Instead, I'm going to present to you my COVID-19 remote research, which I named The Shape of Kelp. So a little bit about me. Um, I just finished my first year as a PhD student uh, with the Marine Biology program at USC. I graduated from Duke with a BS in biology and a minor in evolutionary anthropology. And it took me a bit before I realized that marine biology was absolutely the thing I wanted to do. Um, I came into undergrad thinking that I was going to be a biological anthropologist and I did digs, I worked with fossils and lemurs and all of that. And yet when I was doing all of that, I kept thinking and I kept seeking out all these marine biology opportunities, which is, you know, the right hand portion of this slide. Um, and this conflict continued up until the moment I chose to come to USC for my PhD. And in, in essence, I chose marine biology when I chose USC. Um, but I just want to point out to you guys, like if you are a high school student or an undergrad, and you're just so excited about all these different things to learn and to do, and you, you feel bad that you, know, you haven't chosen anything, don't feel bad, don't stress. It's gonna work out. You're a multifaceted person interested in a really diverse world. So, you know, it's a cool, it's a cool thing. Um, back to my actual presentation. So one of my main research goals is to figure out how to promote healthy kelp forests. And what you see on their screen right now is not a healthy kelp forest. In fact, this is an extremely unhealthy kelp forest that has declined so much that it is now an urchin barren. Um, and now these urchins, uh, they eat kelp. And so basically any kelp that try to grow here anymore and repopulate this forest are just mowed down by these grazers. There's a multitude of reasons why kelp forests decline. So there could be an extreme marine heat wave, uh, which just kills all the cold living kelp. You could have um, some sort of anthropogenic disturbance like urban development, which causes sedimentation and blocks the light for kelp photosynthesis. Uh, you could have an ecosystem disruption. So an urchin predator like a sea otter um, declines because of human interference. And now there's an explosion in urchins and they eat all the kelp. Um, and obviously to, to fix a lot of these health declines, we need to address the, the underlying agent of decline. But while we do that, we can also look at ways to make the kelp more resistant to all these disruptions. And that's the goal of my research. Um, we term this ecological resilience. And basically what we're trying to get is we're trying to get our population to survive a disruption and to recover after the disruption. How do we do this? And a lot of other um, systems, terrestrial systems, or even eelgrass beds, we found that genetic diversity has a lot to do with resilience. So the theory is that if you have high genetic diversity, you have a high chance of having a lucky advantageous mutation or set of mutations that basically help you repopulate after going through a disaster. So what increases genetic diversity besides mutation? Um, gene flow. Gene flow allows you to get a lot of new genetic variants from outside forces like a different kelp patch that's, you know, a little bit of ways. Um, what else affects population genetics? The access and opportunity to mate. That's going to really figure out um, how these new genetics variants are going to be incorporated into the population or which parts of the population are going to continue. So let's talk a little bit about kelp reproduction before we move on. So here you have your adult kelp and your adult kelp are gonna release spores. And these spores are gonna float around in the water column, pushed around by ocean currents and water flow until they eventually settle on the seafloor where they're gonna develop into male and female gametes. Uh, male and female gametes are uh, little reproductive parcels and you can think of them as like a human sperm and human egg. So when a male gamete and a female gamete meet, 
uh, infuse, they create the new life that is the baby kelp. However, there's a lot of other factors that occur and one of the things that can happen is that um, a kelp individual will release spores that will develop into both male and female gametes. So there's a chance that these gametes from the same kelp individual will actually self-fertilize and create a baby whose genetics come from one parent instead of two parents like normally happens. Uh, this can be bad because a lot of times this self baby is going to have lower fitness and is going to be able to uh, survive in a very like lower fashion and it's not going to be able to compete against other kelp um, to the same extent. So is there any mechanisms that stop self-fertilization from happening? Not really. How often does self-fertilization happen? Uh, why don't we think about um, a little bit the reproductive strategy of dispersal. So with dispersal, basically you just release your spores into the wide, wide ocean and what happens happens. You have no control where they go or who they meet. Um, but with dispersal strategies, um, a lot of times uh, the underlying factors of where the amets end up meeting will be dependent on ocean currents, right? So if you have the same, if you're being subject to the same ocean currents as another gamete, you're more likely to end up in the same place than end up mating. Um, so obviously if you're from the same kelp individual, you're gonna be subject to a lot of the same external forces and you're more likely to end up um, mating with those other gametes from the same um, kelp individual. So yeah, there's probably a lot of self-fertilization going on. Now, how much do these um, babies coming from self-fertilization self events um, contribute to the population? Uh, that's gonna depend on how much competition and how harsh the environmental conditions are. So even though it happens a lot, it may not contribute to the population. That is a different, a different part of the question entirely. Um, but in the same vein, um, what other kelp individuals or kelp gametes go, are going to be subject to the same uh, ocean currents as you? Um, it's going to be kelp individuals who are nearby you. And uh, by the nature of kelp forests, a lot of the people around you are going to be your relatives. So they're going to be parents or siblings. And all of this means that uh, these dispersal strategies uh, kind of don't really help you increase your genetic diversity as a population. So what does prevent promote diverse mating. Basically anything that increases gene flow and the opportunity to mate with um, spores and gametes from different kelp patches. And my hypothesis is that spatiotemporal patch parameters such as patch shape will influence, influence these mating opportunities, thus influencing the population genetics such as genetic diversity. So what do I really mean by this? Let's take one example, shape of patch. So the shape of patch is going to affect the water flow, the spore dispersal, and the access to um, outside gametes. Let's pretend this blue circle is your kelp patch. You're looking down from an aerial view. You're like a bird looking down on this kelp patch. And you think to yourself, okay, so where are these outside gametes coming from? They're, they're coming from everywhere besides the blue circle, right? So where are they going to most likely interact? They're going to interact most likely with the perimeter, right? So if you compare this kelp patch shape to this other curvier kelp patch shape where you may have the same area, but you have a larger perimeter, this curvy shape is gonna be um, giving more individuals access to the outside world of these outside gametes that increase genetic diversity. So hypothetically, a, cat, a, a kelp patch that's shaped in this curvy way versus this compact way is gonna be more diverse. Another spatial parameter is density. So here you have um, two situations. This top situation is a densely packed kelp forest, and this bottom situation is a less dense kelp forest. Um, again, these little dots are spores, and these um, spores with this arrow are the migrating spores from a different kelp patch. In which situation are the local spores more likely to mate with the migrating spores. Well, if you have this densely packed kelp, this distance is smaller between local kelp spores, and so they're more likely to interact before these outside spores can even have a chance to interact or mate with any of these spores. 
Whereas if you have this less densely populated kelp forest, you increase the chance that these outside spores will get to interact with this pool of local spores. So hypothetically, lower density will encourage gene flow and thus in encourage genetic diversity. The last thing I want to talk about is a temporal parameter, and this is the length of occupancy. Um, you're going to see in a few slides that kelp patches are very dynamic. So they can change shape, size, locations very, very frequently and uh, in a very short period of time. But the longer that the same area is populated by kelp, the more opportunity the kelp in that area has to mate. Um, so obviously that's going to affect uh, mating and uh, gene flow and genetic diversity. So I'm sitting here. This is my COVID-19 remote research project. I don't really have access to the field or to lab. How am I going to actually study this question? Fortunately, there are a lot of publicly available data sets online, um, and it's just a matter of figuring out how to combine them to answer your question. So the first data set I'm using is a population genetics data set by Johansson and his research group. And Johansson's research group uh, sampled kelp all the way from Alaska to Baja California, which is very impressive range. Um, I focused only on the California kelp. Um, and basically what this research group did is they looked at seven different sites in the DNA. These sites are microsatellites, which I'll explain a little more later. Um, and because kelp are diploids, uh, meaning they have two versions of DNA um, for each gene or each DNA sequence, um, basically in each kelp individual they sampled, they saw 14 pieces of DNA. Quick review, what is a gene? A gene is a sequence of DNA responsible for a trait, for example, hair color. What are alleles? Alleles are specific versions of that gene. So one allele can give you perhaps blonde hair, another allele can perhaps give you brown hair. Um, and in certain orga organisms like adult humans and kelp, um, you have two alleles for most genes. Uh, two alleles in an individual for most genes. You can have multiple alleles. What are microsatellites? Microsatellites are sequences of DNA that repeat, for example, CA, 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 and they're not part of a gene. Why is this important? Well, repeating sequences uh, are more likely to be mutated when, you're being, when they're being copied uh, for reproductive pur purposes. Um, what does this mutation look like? It usually means that um, the number of repeats is gonna vary. So you can have an individual with 22, uh, 22 repeats of CA and an individual with 20 copies of CA. CA. Um, and basically, the more related you, you are, the more likely you're the more likely you're going to have the same number of repeats. Uh, what's the important that's not part of a gene? Um, if it's not part of its gene and if it's neutral, that means that um, evolution or specifically selection, natural selection, is not going to be acting upon or changing this piece of DNA very much. Um, this is important because it gives you a baseline for genetic changes just from mutation and gene flow. And this is basically the canvas on which evolution and natural selection occurs. Um, so this kind of shows you a little bit different from looking at areas with selective pressure. So my second data set is a satellite derived estimates of kelp biomass or the amount of kelp there is um, by Thomas Bell at uh, UCSB. Um, basically what they do is they average this biomass over three months of a year. Um, they average it over a 30 by 30 meter area, which is really good resolution. And this data set goes from all the way back in 1984 up until 2019. Um, I'm going to show you a little bit of this. And this is just each quarter from 2010 to 2015. Um, the gray is the areas where there's no kelp biomass estimates. So this middle gray area is actually an island. And this outside gray area is the ocean where it's too deep for kelp to grow. And all these different colors are kelp biomass estimates. So the more blue it is, the lower the kelp biomass estimate. The more red it is, the higher the kelp biomass estimate. And as you can see, uh, 
kelp patches change dramatically, size, shape, amount, uh, even place. This brings up a very interesting conundrum, and that is if the kelp patch is always changing, how do I compare it over time? How can I tell if it's the same kelp patch that looks a little bit different over time, or if it's two completely different patches at two different times? That brings me to my third data set, uh, which is a maximum patch extent. So Kavanaugh in 2016, he looked at all of these biomass estimates from the data set too. And he said, okay, so which areas do I see kelp existing at the same time and repeatedly? So they are gone at the same time, they're here at the same time. That's more likely to be part of the same kelp patch. Uh, again, and also, which ones are more likely to be part of the same patch based on ha habitat suitability? Um, they're at the right depths, they have the right substrate, all of that. From there, he could uh, estimate basically the kelp boundaries. And within that, I can say, okay, everything within this boundary is basically one kelp patch. So what are the actual variables that I'm looking at? Um, from the first data set, I'm getting allelic richness, which is basically how many different versions of a gene you have in a population, and inbreeding coefficient, which is basically the likelihood that um, an individual has two alleles that are identical or that are inherited from parents that are related. From the second and third data sets, I have total quarterly biomass, perimeter over area, which is um, the curviness or the shape of the patch, uh, biomass over area, which is the density, average number of consecutive quarters with biomass, which is basically the temporal opportunity for mating, and the last estimate I have, which I didn't write down here, is percent coverage, which is how much of the total possible kelp patch is actually being occupied at one time point. So bear with me, I know this doesn't really tell you a lot, but I'll explain it. So basically, when I looked at allelic richness, I found three patch parameters that seemed to correlate. And that was perimeter over area, uh, total biomass, and percent coverage. And basically, it said that a patch that is geographically less compact, supporting lower percent coverage, or which has lower biomass in the past year, is likelier to have a higher number of alleles. That, what does that mean? Let's take a look. So here we have two different patches, one on the left. You can see my mouse, right? Yeah, okay. So one on the left and one on the right. This orange area is the maximum patch and the brown area is how much of the patch is actually uh, has kelp biomass at this specific point in time. So we're comparing these two patches and we think, okay, so which one is uh, more compact, last compact? So because this patch on the left has more perimeter for every area, and this patch on the right has more area for perimeter length, this patch on the left is less geographically compact. So from our results, we would expect this one to have a higher allelic richness than this patch on the right. Okay, which patch has a lower percent coverage? Well, to see this, we have to compare how much of the orange is covered by brown in each patch. And that's, this one has a lot higher percent coverage versus this one. So we would expect from our results that this patch over on this left was going to also have higher allelic richness. Now the last part, the biomass, is a little bit harder to tell from this picture, but you can probably make an educated guess that this patch on the left has a lower biomass than this patch on the right. So from all of our results and just looking at these patches, we would expect this patch on the left to have a higher allelic richness than the patch on the right. Now why this, these results actually kind of support the hypothesis and the logic we discussed at the beginning of the presentation. With the uh, geographically less compact patch, then you're gonna get more access to outside mates and gene flow. Um, and it's kind of the same with the lower percent coverage, there's more available uh, room for all these different genetic variants incoming from other patches. Um, and if you have lower biomass, that means there's uh, less competition. Now for inbreeding, our results are a lot less exciting. Um, basically, I didn't find any significant correlations with shape or timing. 
um, everything seems to be mostly interacting with the actual biomass. So if you have a patch with high biomass in the past five years, you're likelier to have a lower inbreeding. Now this makes sense if you're thinking about um, self or kelp that's the product of um, only one parent versus two parents being less fit than kelp with two parents. So in which case are you gonna have more competition in a patch with high biomass or a patch with low biomass? You're gonna have more competition in a patch with high biomass. So that makes sense that in a patch with high biomass, the individuals that are very inbred are not gonna do well, they're not gonna survive, and thus they're not going to contribute to the population genetics as much. What are my next steps? So after cleaning up my data, uh, I wanna go out and collect more data. I wanna resample some population genetics. The genetics I used is from five years ago, and a lot has changed in those kelp patches with environmental conditions, and even without all those changes, pop population genetics just naturally change over time. It'll be really interesting to see how population genetics have changed and how patch parameters have changed alongside that. Also, a lot of this presentation has been about gene flow, which basically means that what you do matters to your neighbors and what your neighbors do matters to you. So I wanna figure out exactly how that works. Um, how does my population genetics affect my neighbor's population's genetics? How does my spatial parameters affect my neighbor's population genetics? Um, moving on to my ultimate goal of promoting healthier kelp beds, I have to figure out population genetics really do affect kelp resilience. As I said before, it's more studied in terrestrial systems and in like eelgrass beds, but we don't really have like a lot of evidence to show that it affects kelp beds in the same way. Um, and just to round up all of my research questions, I have to figure out if it's actually possible to manipulate the population genetics by manipulating, say, the patch shape. And if this affects the population genetics so much that it can actually affect the resilience as well. So um, in essence, this was definitely not what I thought I was gonna to present to you about. This is not what I thought I was gonna be doing at the beginning of the year. But I've had a really good time just learning about all these different data sets, learning about how I can analyze them and what tools I can use. Um, so, you know, enjoy the process. Research takes you in unexpected directions. Um, I'd also like to thank all these people who are part of my lab, um, either helping me with kelp information, geospatial information, getting me some uh, samples to work with, and just mentoring me and helping me along my first year. Uh, any questions?